As provost of the University of Chicago, I am pleased to introduce Juan de Pablo, who will present today's convocation address. He is the Liu Family Professor of Molecular Theory and Simulations in the Institute for Molecular Engineering at the College and Senior Fellow in the Computation Institute. Professor de Pablo is a leader in developing computational simulations of molecular and large-scale phenomena. The materials he has helped to create have implications in the areas of health, medicine, industry, and academia. As a founding faculty member of the University's Institute for Molecular Engineering and a senior scientist at Argonne National Laboratory, Professor de Pablo develops new technologies and shapes the direction of research in his field. He holds more than 20 patents on multiple technologies and has over 450 publications which have received more than 18,000 citations. In 2016, Professor de Pablo was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, one of the highest professional distinctions awarded to engineers. He was also honored with the 2016 DuPont Nutrition and Health Sciences Excellence Medal for work that is currently used in the global food and probiotic industries and presents opportunities for the preservation of pharmaceutical cells and tissue. Professor De Pablo is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Physical Society. He's an honorary member of the Mexican Academy of Sciences and serves as the chair of the editorial board for the interdisciplinary journal Molecular Systems Design and Engineering. Professor De Pablo has been a member of the University of Chicago faculty since 2012. The title of his talk is Fate, Preparation, and Opportunity. Juan. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Professor Diermeyer. I'm so excited to be here. I cannot think of a occasion that is more worthy of celebration than a graduation. You have worked so hard your entire lives to get to this point, and here we are. You're graduating with an advanced degree from one of the finest universities in the world. That is an extraordinary achievement. And to the parents, husbands, wives, partners, and children of the graduates, we say thank you, because we know that without your help and your support, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to get to this point. So yes, today we celebrate. We are all very lucky to be here. But tomorrow, we'll continue preparing for the rest of our lives. And we all hope that fate will be on our side and allow us to lead rewarding, productive lives. And that is really what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon. Fate, preparation, opportunity, and luck. The Stoic philosopher Seneca once said, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. As I was reflecting on my own career, and I tried to remember the things that I did when I was exactly at your stage in life, fresh out of graduate school, it became apparent that the extent to which I was lucky, it was because I was prepared to take advantage of a series of unrelated events that occurred to me as I went about my own business. You see, just as I was finishing my uh, PhD degree, I went on several interview trips, and I decided to accept a lucrative job with a large chemical company in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. I was so excited about moving to Europe, being on my own, to Amsterdam, of all places, and I was looking forward to having more money. That was important to me. I was done with, uh, with school, like perhaps some of you are. But just as I was getting ready to make that transition from uh, academia to uh, industry, my advisor told me, uh, Juan, you know what? Before you go to Amsterdam, I'd like you to go give a seminar about your research to the University of Wisconsin. I talked to a friend of mine in Madison, and he's uh, eager to meet you, and so are his colleagues. So of course, I followed his advice. I went on that trip. I met, met most of the faculty there. And at the end of that visit, the chairman of the department sat down with me, and he simply said, how would you like to join us here as a professor? And right there, I knew that's what I wanted to do, and I said, I'd like that very much. So without a written offer or anything, that night, I called that company in the Netherlands, and I said, you know what, I'm not coming. I found a different job, and I never regretted that choice. 
So eventually I joined the University of Wisconsin as an assistant professor, full of enthusiasm, and right about the one year mark, things were not going that well. I was having trouble recruiting students. My lectures were not very good. You should have seen my teaching evaluations. And uh, a dear colleague who happened to be my next door uh, office uh, neighbor passed away unexpectedly. And um, before he died, he left instructions to my other colleagues to have his experimental equipment be given to me. I didn't know what to do. You see, I was trained as a theoretician. All I wanted to do use, was use supercomputers to design new molecules. My plans had nothing to do with real life. And here I was, faced with the choice of launching an experimental program. Now, I am an engineer, but throughout my life, I've always been very interested in biology, animals, insects. So as a hobby, I often read journals and books having to do with biology. And as I was pondering this choice about whether to start an experimental program or not, I ran into a really intriguing article about various organisms, insects, and plants that are able to survive extended periods of drought without any water. Some of these insects can, in fact, survive for over 100 years in the absence of water by entering a state of suspended animation. At the time, it wasn't clear how that worked, but biologists thought that they did so by producing large amounts of special sugars and replacing the water in their bodies with those sugars. So in a sense, what these insects and animals were doing was coating themselves with hard candy. I found that fascinating, and I decided to pursue the study of those processes as a research topic. So I did agree to inherit my colleagues' equipment and I started to experiment with insects, plants, and the sugars they produce. And perhaps foolishly, I invested all of my startup funds on that project, which was really far from my expertise. It turned out to be a very good choice, and one that eventually led to publications and with time to processes that allow one to store pharmaceutical products, cells, and even tissues for subsequent transplants over extended periods of time. So when I tell this story to my students and to my friends, to my son, they all immediately comment how lucky I was to start my career in that way. And it is true, I was lucky. But really, in making that transition, I had to take a number of risks. And I could take the risks because I was prepared to take them. I had a broad range of interests, and my advisor in grad school had insisted that I perform some experimental work just to get rid of the fear of doing laboratory work. He was just trying to position all of his students for everything. So Seneca was right. I think that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. That is the advice that I'd like to pass on to you. Preparation is essential for everything you do, and it allows you to take risks. And the story that I just told you really is about creating opportunities for yourselves that will allow you to pursue exciting careers. Now, as Professor Zimmer said, this is the 528th convocation of the University of Chicago. That means that 527 previous speakers have stood right here in front of you, all of them University of Chicago faculty, to give you some words of wisdom. So really, much of what can be said has been said. This occasion, however, is a little bit different. This is the first convocation where the person speaking to you is a professor of engineering at the University of Chicago. So that is really something, if you think uh, about it, engineers at Chicago. You see, um, uh, it is also highly relevant for the thoughts that I'm trying to convey this afternoon. Engineering, really, is a profession that is all about preparation and about taking controlled risks. In its purest form, engineering takes what we learn from the sciences, the arts, and the humanities, and we try to develop technologies that will benefit humanity. That requires breadth. You must keep up with the latest discoveries in a wide range of disciplines, and it involves taking enormous, tremendous risks. Building a plane that can carry 400 passengers from one continent to another, that involves a lot of risks. Designing the pacemakers that millions of people will wear involves risks, and it takes a lot of guts. And of course, in these instances, the difference between assuming controlled risks and recklessness is how much you know and how well you are prepared. 
So a good example of what it means to be uh, deep and broad and outward looking in your profession is provided by the like of uh, Carl Bosch, who can arguably be considered one of the first, uh, well, one of the founders of molecular engineering. With his colleague, Fritz Haber, Bosch developed the process that he used today to produce ammonia. Now, Carl Bosch was the heir to a wealthy family, an engineering concern, really. But rather than joining the family business, he decided to pursue a career of his own. He first received training as a mechanical engineer and later as an industrial chemist. Now we're talking about events that happened about a century ago, when Europe was still importing guano from Chile to make fertilizers. Now Bosch was remarkably broad, and he understood the importance of fixing nitrogen from the air to prepare synthetic fertilizers. He took a discovery by his friend uh, Fritz Haber, who had come up with a uranium-based catalyst to convert nitrogen from the air to ammonia, and he understood molecular transformations well enough, deeply enough, that he could come up with more variable materials that could enable commercial production of ammonia. Now, at the time, very little was known about high-pressure processes, 100 years ago. But Bosch had the engineering background to convince his employer, BASF, about the feasibility of his ideas. And he set out to design giant compressors, ultra-high-pressure reactors that operated at very high temperatures, that handled extremely dangerous explosive gases. And within only five years from conception to practice, he was producing 12,000 tons of ammonia. Now, today, it takes us 20 years to do that. He did that 100 years ago. Now, Carl Bosch was an outward-looking man willing to take tremendous risks to fulfill his vision, and in doing so, he changed humanity. His process saved millions from starvation. And unfortunately, of course, there's a dark side to this story 20 years later, the Haber-Bosch process that he created allowed Hitler to produce explosives in Nazi Germany that helped prolong the Second World War. Bosch himself was a vocal critic of the Nazi regime, and he died in despair. But his legacy has survived the test of time, and today, half of the world's food is involved with the uh, Haber-Bosch process. 80% of the nitrogen in your bodies is produced using this process. Now, of course, the story of Bosch, <clears throat> the molecular engineer, is repeated throughout all fields of study. Even abstract fields, take mathematics, for example. <clears throat> Emmy Noether, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, who took great personal risks when she decided to pursue a career in mathematics as opposed to teaching languages in a school for girls, had to uh, take tremendous chances. When she started college, she was not allowed to formally enroll in math uh, courses at the university, but she could audit them with permission of the individual professors. She somehow passed her graduation exam from the university, and then she took yet another gamble. She was so convinced about her own ideas and her skills that she worked for over a decade without pay teaching mathematics, covering for others, really, as a substitute lecturer. At the time, the early 1900s, women were not allowed to teach mathematics at the university. But working without pay, without a formal title, without a formal position, she went on to develop abstract algebra. She proved Noether's theorem, which in turn enabled the development of all of modern physics. She was brave, she was prepared, and she was willing to gamble her future and her livelihood, really, to get the career that she wanted, not the one that she was told to settle for. So really, I am convinced that taking risks and stretching yourself to the limit of your abilities will make your career and your life a lot more rewarding. And the beauty of it all is that today you leave the University of Chicago with an incredible foundation, one that will allow you to do just that. So I hope that you'll be able to build on that foundation because the possibilities are infinite. Congratulations on your achievements, and I wish you very good luck. Thank you.